Hi, everyone. I'm Kareen Giudini. I'm the Assistant Head of School for Teaching and Learning, and I am excited to be with you today. I think regardless of the unknowns for next year, we're all just relieved to finally be talking about next year. That is, I couldn't agree with you more, Kareen. <laughs> it's exciting to be talking about the 21-22 school year a little bit. Hi, everybody. I'm Brad Rathgaver, the Head of School and CEO of One Schoolhouse. Thrilled to be with you all uh, again today and to be talking about this topic and um, and excited to share a little bit about what we're hearing, but also to, as we get into the Q&A portion of this, hear a little bit about what's happening in your particular neck of the woods. I think one of the things that Kareen and Sarah and I have been super cognizant of is that what's happening with the COVID pandemic is very regional and market driven. Um, and so we know that there are a lot of differences between what's happening, let's say, in Northern California versus what's happening in Memphis, Tennessee. That's a great point that it's regional. And I know you mentioned questions. Let's use the Q&A for questions and please use the chat to connect with other participants. If you've got resources to share, put those in the chat. Um, so this has definitely been a topic in the news and on the listserv that you know folks are starting to think about next year with uh, some joy and some trepidation. So Brad, what are you hearing from schools about next year? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. We're hearing a, a lot of different things. Um, uh, first and foremost, that teachers and academic leaders are just exhausted right now. <laughs> this has been just nonstop for almost a year right now. Nonstop constant changes, nonstop constant rejiggering of what we're trying to do on campus, nonstop trying to support students in very different ways. Um, it feels like we've been on just this incredible roller coaster, and we hope that we can see glimmers at the end of the tunnel on this, but um, we also know to kind of expect the unexpected at this point. Um, so we continue to see just teachers and leaders incredibly exhausted, particularly we're hearing from teachers that they're exhausted because learning in two places is not an effective long-term strategy. Um, you know, we know that a lot of schools right now are having kids zoom into classrooms and they're finding that that's not effective in the long term. Honestly, it's something we wouldn't have suggested even in the, you know, um, uh, even coming into the school year. Uh, but it's really coming to light now that it's not effective for the kids, particularly the ones who are zooming in. And we know that schools need to think about how they're going to support students who can't come to school full time next fall. Um, we keep hearing from schools that they're thinking that some percentage of their kids will not be able or not want to uh, return to campus next fall. Um, honestly, in part, regardless of where we are with some of the vaccine distribution. And we know that in some schools that might look like two or three kids and other schools that might look like 20 or 30 or 40 kids who might not be returning uh, to campus next fall. At, at one schoolhouse, of course, we always try to make sure that we can partner as best as we possibly can with schools in our consortium, that all of our programs uh, that we create from professional development to student side of the house are all in service of what our consortium schools need. And so we're starting to hear from schools just the question, is there something you can do to help so that we don't have to have teachers teaching in two places at once next year? Right. And Brad, I just want to point folks to um, the, some of the evidence on kids and learning this year and how there hasn't been the same growth that kids have. We talked about that last week in our webinar. If anyone's interested, you can go back and find that. We'll throw the link in. And what I really like is the way you differentiated between crisis management, right? So we're doing some things that aren't necessarily what we would identify as best practice and then really having the chance to think about next year. Um, yeah, and they're two different things, right, Sarah? I mean, right. we've talked all along that we've gone through different phases of this pandemic. You know, back at the beginning, it was how the heck can we just make everything be online? And then it was, how are we gonna get through the spring? And then how can we prepare faculty for next year? Well, now we're kind of in this uh, hybrid, again, might be oddly used in these circumstances these days, but we're now in this kind of hybrid school year where it's a mishmash of different things and still not clicking the way we want it to I don't think that anybody wants to be in the position that the 21-22 school year doesn't feel like it's clicking. And yet, if you're not thinking about how to make sure that that's the case starting right about now, it could be really difficult when we get to this fall. Right. 
And um, one of the things I like to say about a hybrid bike is that it works on the trail and on the road, but it doesn't have the front tire on the road and the rear tire on the trail for an extended period of time. Um, so it's so maybe a little bit snarky, but Karine, I know that one schoolhouse has had a chance in the past to support a student who had really specific unique needs. Can you tell us a little bit about what that experience has been like for those students in their schools? Sure, Sarah. So we over the years have always been really responsive to what our school's needs are. And most of you are used to seeing that because you look at our course catalog and you think, well, this isn't a regular course catalog. And it's not because we generally don't need to teach 10th grade English because our schools do. But there are the occasional circumstances. And this, when I say occasional, it's because a lot of our schools haven't had this experience of us. But we do this every year for one or two or three schools. There's the occasional student who needs to spend a semester or their year off campus. And usually it's because of a really joyful opportunity. The child is a highly accomplished athlete or artist and they're going to spend the year acting in Los Angeles or dancing in Moscow or at the Olympic Training Center. And so these are great opportunities for the students, but kids who are working really hard towards their goal out of school don't wanna miss out on school and they still need to continue their education. And so in these circumstances, we've been able to partner with the school so that the student is still enrolled at the school. One schoolhouse is not diploma granting. They're not turning their child over to us, but we work with the school, so the student still receives all of the benefits of being a community member, such as college counseling. Sometimes they can come in for clubs. They can participate when they are in town. They can go to prom and do the senior traditions. Whatever makes a student feel part of that community, they're still a student at that school, but they do all of their academic program with us, or almost all of it. And in those circumstances, what I usually do is I sit down with the academic dean and we look, particularly if the child is not a senior, we look at the four-year plan and we ask, is there a particular course that is really easy for one schoolhouse to do? So we start with those easy ones that we already have. And then we go to the courses that are in the core curriculum at the school that the student needs. And one schoolhouse doesn't have that. And then we talk about how we could meet that need for the child. Sometimes we build the course, run an independent study, et cetera. And then we look at if there's a unique program on campus that one schoolhouse really can't replicate. And we brainstorm and we're a partner to the school and how to figure out how the school can still make that piece of their school program come to life for the child. For example, if you have a graduation requirement around community service, well, one schoolhouse isn't gonna be able to fulfill that need, but I'm an out of the box thinker and I can help you think through how that might work. And so um, in those circumstances, I kind of think of that as our, one of the ways that we're on our continuum of being a partner in innovation. This is kind of one of the outliers, but it's one of the things that's really joyful for us because we get to help you keep a student enrolled in your school and deliver on a hard ask from a parent. Right. And it sounds like too, schools have the opportunity to decide what amount of flexibility in how they define a sophomore year or a junior year. You know, for this student, how do we adapt that if there's something that's a, a real signature aspect? Yes. Really interesting. So Brad Crean talked about what that looks like from the school's point of view and maybe from the students and a little bit about how we partner, but what does it look like for us as an institution? Why are we talking about this now? Yeah, so, you know, Sarah, I'll go back to what I said a second ago to start off with, and that is all of the programs that we create at One Schoolhouse are because our consortium schools have asked us to. And so we are starting to get this ask now from consortium schools. And we're trying to see to what end uh, is this a broad ask or is this a pretty narrow ask at this point? Our school's really looking to us if they have, let's just say, four 10th graders who are not going to be able to come to campus this fall. Are they looking to um, handle that in-house in some way by having kids zoom into the classroom, having a dedicated faculty member working with those kids? Or are they looking really to work with a partner in order to do the coursework for those kids? 
Um, I will tell you all that I've had um, two pretty extensive conversations with schools in the last couple of days that are looking to do that. So if this is a wide need from our consortium, this is the type of program that we would build. Um, so uh, um, what we're looking to do right now is have conversations with schools to see how wide this need is um, and to see if folks are really looking for us to build this type of option really specifically for the 21-22 school year. So for us, and I, Kareen, maybe this is the place where you wanna jump in too, we have, as you know, a catalog of 60 classes, uh, 60 plus classes. Uh, and so uh, it, you know, we can draw from that. There are certain core classes though that we don't offer during either the academic year or at all. So for example, we offer um, Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Geometry, et cetera. In the summertime, we don't offer those as school year courses. So it would mean for us moving some of that. And then there are other courses that we just don't typically offer, ninth grade English, 10th grade English, et cetera. Yeah, Brad, I, I think the need for us right now is the sooner we can know what a school's particular needs are, the better we can shape our program. And so um, we're starting to hear that this need is out there and that there may be particular places where schools know that there are a certain number of students or families who will be looking for this. And while on your end, you're thinking about enrollment management and potentially teacher load and Maybe those two things are coming into conflict because you know that in order to please the family, you could be thinking about having to put extra work on a teacher. And the sooner you know where those friction points are, the sooner we can start to craft a program. And timing for us is ideal right now. I know sometimes this feels a little out of sync for schools, but we are actually interviewing our teacher candidates right now. They go through an extensive training and course development process in the spring, and then we build our courses over the summer. So our ability to meet these needs is somewhat dependent on being able to anticipate them sooner rather than later, particularly in areas where we don't have the class and we would be building it and we would want to make sure we have the right teacher to do the job well. Um, both from one schoolhouse values in terms of how we train our teachers and our pedagogy, but also in terms of understanding schools needs because when we're building for core curriculum, we want to make sure that we're hitting the mark and that we're providing the type of classes that will allow students to seamlessly reintegrate into your program the following year. So Corinne, you touched on something that I want to ask Brad to share his perspective on too, which is all the different ways that schools need to communicate. There, it, you know, there's that need to understand where the friction points are with teachers, what your internal capacities are. But Brad, can you talk a little bit about the conversations that schools should be having with families as well? Well, yeah, sir, it's enrollment management time, right? Like this is literally the time where schools are sending out uh, contracts for next year, both to returning families and to accepted families here soon. And families are going to wanna to know what their options are uh, heading into next school year. And I think that's a very reasonable thing. I also think that it's very reasonable these days for families to expect a level of flexibility of our schools that they didn't expect pre-pandemic. You know, it, it, it was, pretty easy for a school to say, we can't handle that situation pre-pandemic. But in the last 12 months, every school in America has shown that they are much more adaptable and much more flexible than um, they previously even thought that they were, right? And so I don't think that that's gonna be an acceptable answer to families in the same way that it used to be. Um, and I, 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 don't, I don't mean to sound kind of like crass or, or you know, pushy on that. I just, I think that's just a reality. I think that the schools that figure out how are we going to be more flexible for our families, how are we going to create a flexible series of options for our families, are going to be significantly better positioned vis-a-vis -vis their peer schools and their public school counterparts. And I think also there are a lot of independent schools who really see the public school counterparts as, um, as their prime competition. In a lot of different markets, that is the case, right? Public schools certainly are putting um, greater flexibility into their program in a way that they've never had before, too. Right. Many major school systems have announced that they will be offering a virtual option in perpetuity, not necessarily just for another year. 
Yeah, and Sarah, that doesn't mean that they can't put boundaries around them too, right? Like, I, I think it's very reasonable for a school to say, if you're going to do the virtual option, you've got to commit to at least a semester of the virtual option, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's super reasonable. This like, like the in and out of a virtual in-person class, there, we all know that there's lots of reasons not to do that, including continuity. And we've seen like this year why we just don't want to do that. But semester, yeah, that seems pretty reasonable to me, right? Like it, it seems reasonable to me that a family this fall would say, you know, there isn't a pediatric vaccine available, or I have folks in my household who are still, you know, who are, you know, compromised, and I can't have folks coming in and out of my household at the same level. Um, and so I need to commit to, or I can commit to having semester one be online, and maybe we can readjust or re reassess come October, November, if different data points are with us. I mean, that's the type of flexibility that I think we're talking about. I don't think we're talking about the, like, you know, my family wants to go on vacation and so we're going to be doing this class from a different location type thing. Right. Um, keep those owls beaming right. the classroom out. Um, and I think, you know, you open by talking about the, the degree to which we have asked teachers to exercise their adaptive expertise and where we need to um, recognize that we also spent over 20 years telling people not to multitask. Right. <laughs> right. And so that balance has to be struck. Um, I just want to remind everybody, go ahead and put questions in the Q&A if you have questions. I got one um, in the chat to me so that I'll share that in just a minute. And just wanted to think about um, what you said, Brad, about having the conversations at school, at campus, and realizing where on campus do you have or have you built out that expertise and that adaptability and you want to build on it and where do you want to pull back from it and knowing yourself and your your capacities there. Okay. Yeah, and this is this is this is kind of the fun question to me, right? Is is taking some time as a school to reflect upon what you've learned over the last number of months and giving giving your faculty members some time and space, maybe not right now, this is too much of a stressful time to do that, but you know, maybe over the summertime to just sit back and say, oh my gosh, I've learned so much. And now look what we can do as a school because we've all learned so much in these different areas. This is where I think, you know, with a little bit of the glimmer of the light at the end of the tunnel on this, um, we can start to think in really positive, exciting, cool ways about what the future of education looks like and what the future at our school looks like. I was talking to a school the other day that, um, uh, that did its entire, or uh, that did, does a winter program typically. Uh, and they, this year, had like a standard on-campus winter room experience for kids who were able to do that. Um, and then they had a fully online winter room experience that allowed the kids to either be anywhere or, um, uh, or, uh, or just be at home. Uh, and they it like opened up all these doors of possibility to them because they were thinking about what that blend of on-campus experience, online experience, what they could do in that location, what they couldn't do in that location, where these possibilities were for the kids, like it, it was just like, whoa, a very different view of, of, of what was possible. Yeah, I had a similar conversation with a school that has a senior internship program. And the trick with that has always been the seniors who are in AP courses who are trying to get college credit and how far away from campus the AP teachers were willing to let those students go. And they're realizing now that this year, hmm, it might be a lot further than we had in the past, not maybe the next three months, but the year from now and forward. Virtual mentoring experiences, right? Like, I mean, that's that's a thing in a way that I know schools that set up mentor programs and then often was just with local alums who could come to school. I, I, I don't know about you all, I'm having an awesome experience right now mentoring a student at UNC Chapel Hill, my alma mater. I love that. And they never opened that up to those of us who are outside of North Carolina before um, and now have that opportunity to, to mentor this amazing young woman. So we have a couple of questions. Um, one builds on your comment about the pediatric vaccine not being available and a family that is not willing to um, send any of their children to school until there is a pediatric vaccine. Can you talk about how a partnership might work for us in working with this family? Ask this person. Kareen, do you want to talk just generally about like how that typically works with, with a particular kid like that? Sure. So it would always come through the school because we are here to be your partner. So the, the first call to one schoolhouse um, 
would come in and you would just kind of let us know what the circumstances that you're dealing with and um, have outlined what the student's schedule would be next year. And then, oops, I lost my ear. Um, and, and then we would work out what that schedule would look like. Um, presuming one schoolhouse is moving in this direction, we should have kind of the base core curriculum that you will need. And then as Brad mentioned, of course, um, a whole catalog of electives to plug in depending on the student's age. And you would go back to the family. Sometimes we'll have a three-way call between the family, someone from one schoolhouse, and um, someone from your school, usually the academic dean, um, to just talk through with the family, let them ask questions about one schoolhouse. Um, if we are a really known commodity in your school, sometimes this moves really quickly because the child has friends who've already taken a one schoolhouse course, or maybe the student already has themselves. And so um, that, that part goes fast, but sometimes you have to build a little trust that we are an organization you partner with. Our teachers are the same quality as your teachers. Um, the family can feel safe in the quality of education that the child will get and also the relationship that will be built with the online teacher. Um, so kind of making sure that they understand that the courses your ch their child will get from one schoolhouse are comparable to the courses that they would have on your campus. And um, that part, I'm harping on it a little bit because building that trust with the family is really key to the family having a, a really positive experience the following year. Um, and then from there, things roll just like they do when you're registering your regular students for our courses. You put the student's information on the course registration spreadsheet, send it in, and we handle the students on our end, just like we handle all of our students. So our director of student support is there to communicate with you, make sure that um, if the student has any struggles, that they get the supports that they need. Um, and our teachers, of course, engage really robustly in building the relationships and ensuring that the child has a positive experience. Karina, there's one other thing that I just add to that, and that is um, I can imagine a scenario where a school puts this out there as an option for their families. Um, and in those cases, we probably just want to set up with the school uh, a webinar for all interested families. Absolutely, we'd be happy to do that, Brad. So we've got a question in the Q&A and it's a two-parter and I'm gonna ask it out of order just because the second part follows on what you were both just talking about, which is, could somebody adapt a partial program? So maybe they've got a teacher on campus who is excited about teaching an online course. So that covers one discipline, but there are other disciplines where that's not the case. Can you foresee working with a school in that way? Absolutely. And in fact, in some ways, we'd prefer that. We, we know that every school has incredible, unique programs at their schools. And right. helping you figure out, like, how am I going to bring this online in this way? And we love those conversations. You know, Karina and I both, we, we get excited when we get to have those conversations because it's, it's real fun out of the box thinking. I, I think, you know, what schools would be probably smart to think about is your standardized stuff that's not that different from campus to campus. If I was in your shoes, I wouldn't put um, my time and energy towards, um, towards thinking about bringing those courses online myself, right? Like if, you know, algebra one is not that different school to school to school. So, and I think too, that's, that would speak to what Corrine was mentioning earlier about keeping that student close and fully enrolled in, in your community because that student is still taking part of their experience and maybe they can still be on the sports teams. I mean, their sport is outdoors and that's something the family is comfortable with. And Brad, you mentioned that it, independent schools have demonstrated an enormous amount of adaptability. Um, so the first part of this question was, would this program be available to non-consortium schools as well? Sure. Um, but given the low cost of joining the consortium, I would be surprised if a school wouldn't join a consortium if they were putting this program together for their families. And one question, are we thinking about this for elementary and middle schools as well as high schools? We are not. Um, we are not in a position to be able to build out a full program for elementary and middle school students. And there's some reasons not to do it too for elementary and middle school age kids. 
Um, that being said, I believe that some of our courses have had eighth graders in them from time to time. They have, um, you know, for those of you that are, that, that don't know, the one schoolhouse curriculum is a high school curriculum. Uh, and yet we also know that there are some seventh and eighth graders who are fully capable of taking high school level coursework. Um, I always like to give the example of one of our earliest students who was a seventh grader when she took AP Music Theory and scored a five on the AP Music Theory exam. There are those extraordinary kids out there and we wanna make sure that they have opportunities to be challenged at the appropriate level for them. Um, but one schoolhouse is a, is a high school program. I, would a college give credit for a seven-year-old AP score, I wonder? <laughs> I wonder if there's a time limit on that. I'm just That's curious about question, that. Sarah. I'm sure that child went on to accomplish more in music <laughs> than the AP score. <laughs> I feel certain. Um, so one of the things that I think folks are also probably wondering about is what's the time frame for something like this? Like, Obviously, Kareen, you've talked about how we're hiring and course building, and we do that pretty often, just like schools are now releasing their course catalogs and talking about what classes do you want to take with students. That's one of the counters to the doldrums of February, right, to start thinking about what am I going to enroll in next fall. So what's your ideal time frame? What I want is for this to be as useful as possible and as timely as possible for schools. And so one of my concerns, and this harkens back to my own days in a face-to-face -face school, is that sometimes the school administrators don't know when a family is thinking about leaving. And they don't know all the reasons why a family might be thinking about leaving. Mm -hmm. And so you go through this kind of silent window of enrollment management where you're talking to your teachers and your deans and trying to make sure that you're as visible and available as possible for those families who may need to have an extra conversation. And so I think the most important piece of timing is communicating within administrative teams at schools right now so that you decide if this is gonna be a viable option and you figure out how you're gonna communicate this option to your families. And the timing is now because it's re-enrollment season. Yeah, and the only thing I'd add to that is, you know, Kareen, just as with this, as in so many other conversations that we end up having with schools, we know that sometimes it can be helpful um, to have the language when you're approaching families about these things. Um, over the last number of years, for example, we've had a ton of schools move some language strands to one schoolhouse online. Um, and we know that the uh, that, that that has worked more effectively in some schools, depending upon the language that is used with families when you announce that program out. We have all that language. We have all the kind of, we know what is effective with families. We know what's not effective with families. And so to the extent that it's helpful to have conversations with us around how you might roll this out to families, please be in touch with us on that too. We can help in a lot of different ways in that regard. That's a great reminder. We are running out of time. So I just want to thank both of you. I appreciate Thanks, your insights on this. And I think it's, it is nice to be thinking about September, 2021, or at least a little bit. So everybody hang on out there for February. Uh, we're not even halfway through yet, but it, it will go. <laughs> Alrighty. Bye-bye.